uh, as, as we get started, we're, we're still talking about loving like you've never been hurt. Let me just make this statement. I want you to get this. It is impossible to get through life and navigate relationships without getting hurt in the process. It's impossible. So the question isn't, am I going to get hurt? The question is, what are you going to do, and how do you deal with the hurt? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about the, this, this afternoon just a little bit now. Um, I noticed several years ago that uh, something about me that, I, that caught me by surprise as I was reading and I got towards the bottom of the page, I, I caught myself doing this. And I thought, that's weird. So I started paying attention and I, and I realized that my eyesight, it was, there was something wrong. So I thought, man, I, I need to go see an eye doctor. Something's wrong. So I went to the eye doctor and I said, what's the deal? He goes, you're, you're getting old. Wow, I was afraid to ask for a second opinion. And I said, you're ugly. But it's called macular degeneration. Sounds bad, huh? Macular, what it means is you're, you're getting old. And so it's, it's, it's difficult. Now, some people have done this. Say, Pastor Dave, what do you think? I think you're in my face. What I've discovered in this stage of life, I need a little bit of distance to get clarity. I need a little distance to get clarity. So when we're talking about struggles, when we're talking about hurts, because it's impossible to get through life, it's impossible to navigate relationships without getting hurt, our best perspective is not up close and personal while we're in it. Our best perspective is to create a little distance so we can see things clearly. Is this making sense? Right? And so, uh, so thinking about this a little bit, some of life's best defining moments we can miss because we're just too close. Sometimes those defining moments don't show up as defining moments until later we go, oh, now I get it. That ever happened to you guys? Later on you go, oh. Not unless somebody tells a joke and you get it weeks later. That's just a different thing, but, but you get it. So, so and see, I, I wonder if sometimes we're missing the best parts because when we're in it, sometimes all we see is the struggle and the hurt because there's a lot of stuff that we can enjoy along the way, right? Now, when we focus on the struggle, it's all about survival. And the, the hurt, has the ability or the permission to redefine the mission. You, you have a direction in your life, you got things going on pretty good, and sometimes we get hurt in the process, and that can get us off mission and redefine the mission, right? Now, today, September 30th, it has been exactly 28 years to the day from our first Sunday here at New Life. 28 years to the day. So, that's, that's a lot of Sundays. So our, our first Sunday here... Uh, I was, I was young and good looking back then. Well, I was young, but uh, we showed up and it was just that building over there, and there was just uh, just a handful of people. So, so we just felt God calling us to, to to do this, and so we we packed everything up, and we we moved into the the unfamiliar to embrace the unknown. Now, me, I was a hundred percent convinced, man, let's do this. We're at a seventy-five, well, maybe sixty. 60% convinced. Jessica came in at a good solid 5%. She said, great, we're moving to Porterville. Now I'm going to marry Mexican. Have you met Louie? It's hilarious. And so, so 28 years later, so, we, so we, we, we came to Porterville. We stepped into a world that was dominated by very well-guarded traditions. It was dominated by a bad reputation. And it was just a handful of people, just a handful, that was always here. And some of them didn't like me at all. Somebody said, well, how do you know that? Because they told me. They said, we don't like you. Now, you, you guys might not have discernment, but I, I caught on to that right away, you know. Matter of fact, one guy said this. He came to me a few months later, and he goes, uh, I need you to forgive me. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, when you, when you first became pastor, I, did, I didn't like you, and I didn't, didn't think you'd be a very good pastor, so I need you to forgive me. Of course. Sure. He goes, I still don't think you're a very good pastor. I just don't want to have to carry that around. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So it was, it was just a really, really tough, tough, tough atmosphere. But as the mission started to push forward, the tradition 
push back hard. As the mission pushes forward, tradition pushes back hard. I want, there's a message in that. So as your life's mission is pushing forward, as you're making progress, as things are getting better and you're getting better at this, your traditional role in life, your traditional habits, your t- traditional lifestyle will always push back hard. And if we're not careful, we'll say, it hurts to push forward, so maybe I'll just step back. That's, that's what can happen, okay? So, so, so anyway, so be, because we were able to keep the mission in mind, the struggles didn't get us off course. Three years ago, they put together a video for the, for the 25th anniversary, just some stuff we want to remind you of that kind of settles it. So we'd like to show you that video again this morning, okay? I really feel like we're, we're the best position we've ever been to really continue, not just simply momentum, but absolutely significant change for our, our city. first Easter service in, in the main building. The building was nowhere near complete. They had a roof over it, <laughs> plywood on the sides, and we, we put in uh, folding chairs. And we, we had church. And, uh, and, and it wasn't because we really wanted to do something visionary. It's that we realized that we were in the old building and there was no way in the world we could fit any more people into where we were at because just it was just busting out the walls. And so that Sunday was, was pretty incredible because we could really tell that God was doing some phenomenal phenomenal things and then uh, watching the generations just where I think uh, we're seeing now some some third generation and uh, and they, they call me Papa Dave and that's that's my joy and just watching families that really had no hope of even staying together now multiple generations are just making it work and so yeah, life change, that's, that's the coolest memories of them all. When I see our church becoming the Church of Porterville, that anybody can come here, we love people. It's not fake, we are who we are. And I just, I love where our church is going. I love how much we've grown from when we first came, we had to wear dresses and, you know, going to the movies was a sin. And just how much we've grown and the people we have, it feels great to serve God and have a relationship with God without any limits and without any bondage or boundaries around your relationship with God. So I think from 1990 to 2015, just the way we can serve God and worship God with such freedom, I think that's where I see our church going, serving God with freedom and people are seeing that it's not a boring relationship with God. You can serve God and have a blast doing it and I think that's what our church shows people. Just trusting Him and helping people to trust him so we can walk this journey out together and uh, continue to try to win souls for the Lord so we could all go to heaven together and it could come none too soon, but not till my grandkid gets here, okay? <laughs> I'm looking forward to, in my, my later years, to just kind of watching uh, the people just really just kind of take the ball and run with it. And that's what, you know, that's what Habakkuk said. He said, uh, you take the vision, you make it plain on tablets. So when they read it, they'll run with it and so obviously with the direction things are going and the momentum that we have and great leaders coming up around us and an incredible church behind us the future actually looks way better than the past it's like exploded it's like everybody is like wow that's the church it's, it's just getting better and better This is where you're accepted no matter what you look like, what you act like. They just accept you for who you are. We will always love whoever steps through those doors.
All right, that was three years ago, still going strong, God's still going great stuff. Early on, we made the choice that we're going to love whoever stepped through those doors. No matter what, and, and that's what we hope that you feel when you walk in. We hope that you feel the love of God from the people. We hope that you are surrounded by God's presence. That's what's really important. So we, we determined to do that. Now, some people showed up and they, they were hurting. Some people showed up and they hurt us, but we decided we're going to love them anyway because that's really what we're about. Now, now the reason I bring this up is, is I hear people make this statement that, that, that kind of bugs me. And maybe you use this statement. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I might. But they say, well, everything happens for a reason. Now, if you've used that, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but that bugs me. Because sometimes that's a very callous thing to say when somebody's going through tragedy. Okay, it's like, whoa, are you kidding me? What reason could there be? Now, now, maybe, maybe there is some truth in it, like, you know, uh, Isaac Newton's third law of motion, so for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So maybe sometimes, you know, maybe the reason is God's trying to change something. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe the reason is that's just part of life. Maybe the reason something happens is because people can be cruel. And maybe the reason is you just made a dumb decision. I've had people come to you and say, Pastor Dave, why is this happening? Because you did something dumb. All right? Okay, so, but, but anyway, so I, I don't want to dismiss the statement as not having any validity or not meaning anything or, or, or really basis, but what I'm going to say is I'm not so sure that that's a, an, an adequate answer for the lives that we want to live. Because I think what happens is that the problem I have with the statement of everything happens for a reason it only leaves you with one question, and it's the wrong question. So if you're convinced that everything happens for a reason, the only question you can ask is why. Why did they do this? Why didn't they do this? Why did I do that? Why didn't I do that? Why did God do this? Why didn't God do this? Why? And so, so you might think that why is a really good question, but why may solve the mystery, but it doesn't do anything to move you towards destiny. That's what makes it the wrong question, okay? So searching for the why is often how we find ourselves digging a hole. That can actually lead to some pretty serious depression. So there's a, there's a guy in, uh, in Judges chapter 6, and his name is Gideon. I think Gideon is a pretty insecure guy. He's got issues. Because we find Gideon, and here's what it says, that he's, he's a, an, an angel comes and it sits underneath the oak tree and he's got, got a message for Gideon. And he finds Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. So what it is, he, he's separating the kernels of wheat from the stock and he's doing it in this hole. So they would, they would dig a hole, line it with rock, and they would, they would trample the grapes, you know, the, the wine press. And so he's hiding in a hole trying to get enough for survival. Okay, that's where he's found, right? And so, so that's what I'm saying. So sometimes when we're, when we're looking for why and we don't find it, the, the solution that we come up with is, is to ask why. So it's in verse 12 when the angel appeared to him and said, Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. So when God shows up and God says, you know, I want you to go know this, that God will not call you who you are. God will call you who you're supposed to be, Right? You got to get this. So God says, God is with you, mighty warrior. Now, because his perspective was from pr the perspective of hurt, from this pr perspective of struggle, because Gideon's perspective is everything happens for a reason, the only question he's left with, even though God has shown up, is why? It's in verse 13. But Sir Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And so, so now, now this is just a, such a real perspective. He's so hurt, so beat up, so frustrated. He said, you know what? I don't want to deal with it. And he hides out. So he puts himself in his hole, minimizes his life, isolates himself from others, just wondering why it's why is going on, right? So now because of Gideon's hurt, he couldn't see above surviving. Anybody been there? The only thing to think about is like, man, life just really sucks right now. He couldn't see above that. Now, now, when I, I think about Gideon hiding in that hole, I think about when I was a kid, uh, my, my uncles and my dad all got together and they bought my grandmother a 1958 Buick station wagon. Gigantic car. 
It was like, like 30, 35 feet long, giant car, huge. And it was this really long station. It looked like a hearse with windows. Just a, just an odd looking car. Now, now the problem is my grandma was four foot 10 with shoes on. Short lady. She couldn't reach the pedals. So they literally, they, they bailing wired four by fours under the pedals for her. Set her on a pillow. Put all these little kids in the back seat. And sent us down the road in the death mobile. I mean, think about that. You got this little old lady. She can't reach the pedals, so you, you, you wire four by fours on the pedals. You put her on a pedal, on, on, on a pillow, and you send them down the road with all of your precious children. Maybe they had a plan. I don't know. And the, but the scary part is, is the station wagon had, had, had that giant steering wheel. Remember the giant steering wheels? Yeah. And Grandma was so short, her only vision was between the dash and the top of the steering wheel. So she's driving like this. And there's all of us little rug rats in the back seat. And when Grandma would come to the top of the hill, it terrified us because we know she can't see anything. She tops the hill at 60 miles an hour. It's like, well, I hope nothing's on the other side. Terrified. So, so here's Gideon hiding in this hole. He can't see over the dash. He can't see what's going on. So all he sees is the terror that he's going through, right? So now, now and I find it interesting that when God showed up, rather than saying, thank you, or at last, or, or thank you, hallelujah. Gideon's response is, because he's been hurt, Gideon's response is, why? Why? But this is what I think makes this story so incredible. So instead of God giving him a why, God gives him a what. So you might be asking God for a why, and God says, you don't need a why. Why am I in this hole? So what? Rather than saying, why am I in this hole? How about saying, how do I get out of the hole? Rather than saying, why did all this stuff happen? What do I do to get, this, get me out of this situation? So God gives him a what? God even says, go in the strength that you have. See, the why will hold you hostage. The what will move you forward. The what is what makes you mighty. The why is what makes you weak. Why is what victims ask. What is what victorious ask. You see what I'm saying? So how, how about you start asking God for a what instead of a why? And instead of why is all this happening, is okay, God, what's next? How do I get past this? How do I use what you have in my life right now to do something better? See, there's a bunch of people that are wrestling with why when God has already revealed a what. See, get this. This is important. God's not going to bless your mess when he's already blessed your mission. Say, God, I, I know this relationship is jacked up, but I need you to bless it. Why would I do that? God's not going to bless your mess when he's already blessed your mission. If, if, if you come from a bloodline of issues and you're participating in those issues, God's not going to bless those issues. God said, you know what? I'm not blessing that because I've already blessed this. How about instead of you doing that, how about you do this? Instead of asking God to bless the whole, God's going to bless the harvest. Get up out of the hole and be the person that you're supposed to be. See, you like, good, like Gideon, God is calling you to rise up above that. Rise above the hurt. Rise above the anger. Rise above the loss and the drama so that God can do something significant. Stop hiding in the hole. You know, now, we've all been hurt. Everybody's got scars. Everybody's got stories. You ever been around a group of people that want to compare their illnesses? Want to see my scar? No. Did you know that some people have even tried to show me parts that they keep in a jar? You know, like the doctor took it out and they saved it. I'm going to need that someday. Which is crazy. So everybody's got hurt. Everybody's got stories. Everybody's got scars. Remember, it is impossible to navigate life, navigate relationships without getting hurt. So the question isn't, have you been hurt? The question is, what are you going to do with the hurt? How are you going to navigate through that? See, see, get this. Before we showed up, we showed up September 30th, 1990. Before we showed up, dozens and dozens of pastors came before us. 
doesn't. And because of the hurt that they experienced, the hurt got them off mission. And they weren't able to complete the mission God had for them. So here's the deal. It's not that I'm better than them. Some of those guys are amazing. They're friends of mine. Because God's not looking for a better man. God is looking for a determined man. So I'm not better than them. I just happen to be determined. Anybody in here determined? I am determined to keep my kids in mind. I am determined to keep my marriage together. I am determined to keep my family solid. I am determined to keep myself sober. I am determined to move life forward. God is looking for determined people, not talented people. What a relief. Aren't you glad? If God was looking for talented people, we are in trouble. Right? So, so what happens is when we allow the hurt to determine direction, the mission gets lost in the pain because that's all you think about. Some of you guys, you got your favorite NFL team. Like there's some of you guys that are Raiders fans. See, I, I don't know what it's like to be a Raiders fan because I've never been to jail. I'm just kidding, just kidding. Uh, that was funny. So some of you guys are Niner fans. That's, yeah, that's the only time you get to cheer today. Some of you guys are cow, I mean cowboy fans, you know. Some of you guys are Browns fans. Oh, just kidding. Some of you guys are the really, really, really smart people and you're Packers fans. But see, you've watched your quarterback stay in the pocket. He's about to get just creamed. That linebacker's right on top of him. He knows he's going to get crushed. And he hangs in there and makes the pass at the very last moment. And you watch him just get wiped out. Why would he do that? Because he's not focused on the pain in front of him. He's focused on the goal downfield. Listen to me, friends. That's how you win. In life, the linebacker is going to be in front of you. It happens. And if you focus on the linebacker, you'll never make the play. But if you could focus on the goal down in front of you, my friend, that's how you advance the game forward, right? So, so, so be, because he's looking down the field, that's where he gets it. Now, let me, let me kind of wrap this up. It's, it's been a little bit over 20 years ago. We were building this, this building. And it was a really long process. It took a lot of work, a lot of finances. Things were tough. Uh, volunteers lied to me. You know how that works. It's just all this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm discouraged. I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I'm just completely worn out. So I was down here, we'll call it praying. Or something like that. I, I was just... just beat up. I, I was down in this area right here and, and, and you know how sometimes when, when, when somebody stands in a doorway you can kind of see the shadow it kind of kind of blurs the light just a little bit so, so I turned around to see this just this, this silhouette of a figure and uh, of course I remember I'm, I'm tired, I'm beat down, all kinds of complaints I thought great, another inspector to tell me something else is wrong, you know and so I said, can I help you? Because I learned in the process get out of here get out of here is not a good response. So I said, can I help you? And I waited, and there was no response. And I waited a little bit longer, and they, they just stood there, didn't say a word, just total silence. So I got up, and I walked that direction. And as I got closer, I could see it was a, an, an older man. And I got up really close, and I could see the tears running down his cheek. And he just looked around. And he choked out these words that I will never forget. He says, this is just the way we saw it. And what I found out is years before I showed up, years, he was part of the leadership team of New Life. He and some of those other leaders stood out and looked across this barren landscape, but there was nothing here. And they said, one of these days, one day, 
We'll build a church for anyone right there on that spot. And he stepped through those doors, and that, my friends, was his one day. So here's what I discovered that day. God didn't put the dream in my heart. It was God's dream all along. God was simply looking for somebody who was determined enough to move past the hurt, move past the hardship, move past the struggles, and do what God wanted to do. So here's what I'm saying for you. Yes, you're going to get hurt in the process. Yes, things are going to happen. You're going to be discouraged. People are going to call you names and nasty stuff. People call me names I had to look up. <laughs> what do you say? I really didn't get my feelings hurt until I looked it up. I said, hey, wait a second. So God is not looking for somebody to be this great warrior. God is looking for somebody to be determined in battle. Determine so much that the struggles won't get you off a mission. That was his one day. That's what Paul was meaning in Philippians chapter 3 when he said, forgetting those things that are behind. Forget the fact that this happened. Forget the fact that this didn't work. Forget the fact that you've been hurt. Forget the fact that people have said things. Forget the fact that people have abandoned you. Keep your eyes on the prize. Move your life forward to be who God wants you to be. Don't get stuck in the hurt, my friend, when God has a mission. See, the story of you was in the heart of God before you ever were. God wants you to be determined. I just wonder. Just, just, just wonder. Are there any stubborn people here today? I mean, really, are there, are there any stubborn people here today? Let me see your hand. Come on, are you, are you stubborn? People ever called you stubborn? They might add a few adjectives with it, but that's okay. When you look up stubborn in the dictionary, part of the definition will say determined. People say you're stubborn. You go, uh, 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 uh. I'm determined. Thank you. God is not looking for the brave, the strong, the talented. God's calling the stubborn. Too stubborn to know that you're beat. Too stubborn to know that the battle is too hard. Too stubborn to know that you can't win. Too stubborn to know that you should give up. Too stubborn to, to, to give up on your family. Too stubborn to give up on your kids. Too stubborn to give up on your marriage. God is looking for the stubborn people to bring about greatness in the world we live in. Are there any stubborn people in the house today? When life is trying to push you down in the hole, I'm telling you, my friend, rise up. Get up out of the hole and start walking this out. Instead of wondering why, how about if you start asking God for a what? What now, God? What do you want me to do now, God? What steps do you want me to take? Engage the process. So what do you mean? Put yourself in the game. All the cheerleader jobs are taken. Besides, you look stupid with pom-poms. Come on. Don't get your feelings hurt. I'm talking to the guys. Like in a video when, Je when Jessica said, you know, she, was, she, she didn't like having to wear dresses. Yeah, I, I hated having to wear a dress. There's more to the story. Engage the process. What's that mean? Go to church. So well, I'm here, no, like, like all the time. We need to be surrounded by a circle of warriors to help us fight those battles so we don't fight alone. We call those small groups. We need to be able to sharpen our weapons for warfare. That means consistently in prayer and study and sharing and giving. We need to be trained to fight the battles. And we do that by consistently and regularly serving. Engage the process, my friends. Now, over those 28 years, there have literally been thousands of reasons for me to give up. Give up. Thousands of reasons for me to quit. But when I look out over these seats, I see hundreds of reasons to stay. Yeah. 
I've, I've fought a lot of battles. In 28 years, I've fought a lot of battles. Some I did pretty good, some not, not so good. I've fought a lot of battles that I shouldn't have. Died on some hills that weren't worth it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But the reason I fought all those battles, because those are the battles I don't want you to have to fight. I won them for you. Because I believe that you deserve better. The battles that you are fighting today, I hope you realize, the reason we want you to win those battles is there's people coming up behind you that you don't want to have to fight the same battle. That's what this is all about. That's why we don't allow the struggles to get us off mission. That's why are we determined. That's why we are stubborn, too stubborn to give up because there's people following us that need us to win these battles. Is this starting to make sense? Don't allow the struggles to redefine the mission. Our future really is greater than our struggle. It really is. The best is yet to come. So I want to challenge you to start looking among the ruins. It's in uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah is just a regular guy doing a regular job. Matter of fact, he's actually got a pretty good job. <laughs> Nehemiah's job is to taste food for the king. That, that's honestly his job. What's your job? I'm a taster of food. <laughs> Sign me up. Wow. But he, God drops his dream in his heart, and he wants to do something different. So, because the city that he came from, his hometown, is in ruins. And when people walk by, all they see is destruction. And there's nothing there. The, the walls are torn down, and the gates are burned. And most people see nothing but tragedy. But when Gideon looks among the, the stones, instead of the ruins, Gideon sees resources. And he pulls what others think are stumbling blocks from the pile of rubble. And he builds himself a way out of the hole. Take the struggles that you're going through right now. Pull those struggles from among the ruins. Build yourself a way out so that your life is not defined by what you've been through, but your, def your life is defined by what you're going to. I have not been given 28 years of struggles. Not at all. God gave me 28 years of mission that just so happened to come with struggles. I'm not sorry for the struggles because the struggles are, are what made me stronger. The man I am today is the man that has come through the struggle. I just came through seven months of cancer treatment. And today I'm cancer free. I've had people say, well, Pastor Dave, you are tough. No, I'm stubborn. I am determined that when the doctor said you have cancer, I say, oh, heck no. I determined that day I refuse to die of cancer. I may be ran over by a truck, but I will not die of cancer. I might get shot making a visit on the east side, but I will not die of cancer. <laughs> I'm here today not because I'm strong but because I'm determined I'm determined to not allow the struggle to redefine the mission because the best is yet to come could I get you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment So what's it take to get you out of the hole? What's it going to take to move your life forward? What's it going to take to pull the stumbling blocks from the ruins and build yourself a way out? 
Some of you are here today and you're facing some of the toughest battles of your life and you have no idea what direction to go. Some of you are perplexed or maybe you're broken, maybe even depressed. And you know what, God? I don't understand. Why is all this going on? I'm going to challenge you right now to drop the why and start asking God for a what. God, what do you want me to do to move my life forward? Some of you are sitting here and you're in the battle of a lifetime. You feel like everything is on the line. You're trying to put on a strong front, but something inside of you feels like you're dying. You almost feel stuck. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand real quick and put it right back down. Come on, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Some of you feel like you're, you're losing everything. Like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm going backwards at 100 miles an hour. If that's you, show me a hand real fast. Come on, come on. Thank you. Some of you here today, you feel like you're in a hole. I don't even know how to get out of this. I don't even know how to move life forward. You need a way out. Show me your hand. Say, that's me. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Could y'all stand this afternoon, please? So what's it going to take? First of all, you're going to have to be stubborn. Check. <laughs> you got that right? See, some of you didn't even know stubbornness was a great quality. You just got to quit, quit aiming it at yourself and start aiming it at the devil. Right? Stop asking why. Because even if you find the why, it, it, it doesn't move life forward. See, people think that's going to answer questions, but it, it really doesn't. Start asking God to show you the what. What's the next step? What do I do from here? And here's the cool thing. You can hear from God just as much as I can. Matter of fact, if you find yourself saying this, like, well, I don't know if that's me or is that God. Just remember, you're not that smart. <laughs> There's no way you would come up with that on your own, right? So today I want to challenge you to take an action step, okay? Gideon had to climb out of the hole. I want to challenge you to take an action step. Maybe it's just praying right where you're at. Maybe you just close your eyes, drop your head, and just pray right where you're standing. Okay, God, here I am. I need you to show me the what. Maybe it's turn around and just kneel down at your seat where your butt was. At least it was your butt. And just pray, okay, God, I need you to show me the what. Maybe it's coming down here and kneeling here. Maybe it's praying with one of our prayer partners. I need you to help me pray. But take a definitive action step to move life forward. Because here's what I know. I know you are not okay hiding. We're trading our why for a what, right? You guys ready? Come on, let's pray. Father, we come before you.